Good morning. My name is Keith Phillips. I'm the Vice Chancellor of uh, Alabama Community College Workforce Development and Economic Development, as well as the Executive Director of the Alabama Technology Network. As we begin to celebrate Manufacturing Day, and for us in Alabama, we celebrate Manufacturing Month, uh, today we want to have a conversation, a panel discussion, if you will, with members from our team from across the state, including the Alabama Technology Network, the Alabama Community College System, and one of our partner organizations, Manufacturer Alabama. With that, I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves. Good morning. I'm Brad James. I'm the center director in Tomlinsville, Alabama, southwest part of the state. Jeff Graham. I'm the director. I have responsibilities at Alexander City Center, the Fala Center, and Montgomery Center. I'm excited to be here today. Good morning. My name is Levada Varner. I have the privilege of serving as the director for the uh, Central Alabama, Central Six uh, Alabama region, as well as the West Alabama region. Good morning. I'm Ronnie Kaiser, director at uh, Northeast Alabama Community College campus, also included um, our Opelika Center and Muscle Show Center. Good morning, I'm Amanda Riles and I'm a project engineer for food safety. Good morning, I'm Barry May. I'm the executive director of workforce and economic development with the Alabama Community College System. Hello everyone, my name is Robin Ricks. I'm the director of special programs and workforce development at Manufacture Alabama. Thanks for having me. Let me begin by thanking all of you for joining in this panel discussion today. And we appreciate this group and the work that all of you do in supporting manufacturing in the state of Alabama. And with that, let's get to the questions. So my first question for the panel, from a national and state perspective, manufacturing is incredibly important to our GDP and employment, providing great jobs for families. What do you believe the state of manufacturing is in Alabama today and where do you see Alabama's footprint in the next five years? Well, I'll go ahead and offer just some quick insight from the perspective of Manufacture Alabama. Uh, I think our association has been here in the state of Alabama for the last 25 years, and we have seen the manufacturing sector grow exponentially uh, here in our state uh, from being very really almost unrepresented as an economic driver to being consistently one of the top three economic drivers in our state. And we don't expect to see that slow down. We're constantly seeing um, businesses express interest in coming to work uh, here in Alabama. And then we're also seeing a lot of existing industry invest in expansions here in our state. Uh, so we see the future as being extremely bright for our industry sector. Uh, of course, we're experiencing challenges related to workforce. That's something that I think everyone on this panel discusses on a regular basis. And, and we're strong partners and working to um, rectify some of those challenges. Uh, but the future is very bright and we see nothing but growth ahead. We know that the automotive industry has made significant impact here for the state, but also just uh, domestically and globally, um, the automotive industry footprint uh, that Alabama represents um, that has been significant uh, with the recent addition of Mazda Toyota added uh, to our portfolio, in addition to all those that have uh, been here for the last uh, 20 to 25 years, where we, in addition to Mercedes, Hyundai, Honda, the automotive industry continues to grow. So each of those OEMs have their respective supply chains and they're making significant impact uh, from North Alabama all the way down to South Alabama. And to kind of add on to what Veda has said was down here in the southern part of the state, since some of the expansions and projected projects we could see coming out of the port of Mobile um, will make it, you know, one of the largest, if not the largest, on the Gulf Coast. And so a lot of the things that are shipped out through Savannah through the automotive sector will come further south. So you see the expansion and infrastructure and things like that. Logistics has become a very big thing, not only here, but across the entire state. So I think you see those continue to grow. But in addition to the importance of those OEMs and the, the locations we've had in the state of Alabama, the tier two, the tier two, threes and fours that are supporting that supply chain, LaVeda mentioned, um, we do a lot of training with those companies. 
and it's been an adjustment, but it's been an adjustment they have invested their time, money, and resources in, and I think that's what's helping drive that growth because when they look at Alabama, they start to see a full package, not just a place to locate in the OEM. Alabama is very strong in manufacturing. Uh, in fact, uh, Alabama exceeds the national average in the supply of manufacturing jobs by over 52% for similar size areas. Uh, Alabama is a great state to do business with. It's, it's low taxes and strong support for workforce development uh, gives us a, a strong competitive advantage against uh, other states. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have any challenges because there, there are plenty, as, as you all know, but the states that come out on top will be the ones that take on those challenges head on and offer innovative solutions to address those. Data sources such as MC and Burning Glass continue to show that uh, in the next five years, it's gonna be uh, our manufacturing industry is gonna show strong growth. And really that's been a blessing to our state as we've gone through the pandemic, having that diverse uh, number of industries in the state, the diverse workforce, diverse set of skill sets. And a lot of those skill sets are transportable. So I appreciate all of your comments uh, on that particular question. So let's, let's move to the next question. There's a lot of discussion about industry 4.0 and advanced manufacturing. From your perspective, what tools, services, or resources are necessary to keep Alabama on the cutting edge for manufacturing? We've got to be laser focused on providing only the training for the skills needed to prepare a person for specific jobs in the shortest amount of time possible by offering competency-based training models. Uh, we're also looking at more opportunities for students to earn college credit for those, those skills that they gain in short-term non-credit training and on the job training using the micro credentials and other industry recognized credentials that are stackable. Also uh, to allow our companies to keep on the cutting edge, we've got to offer cutting edge training that provides students with training in the latest and emerging technologies. To do that, we're gonna need to continue developing and upgrading our instructor skills, as well as updating our training equipment to support those technologies. And um, another tool that is necessary, but not utilized enough by industry is apprenticeships and work-based learning models. The manufacturers that have uh, bought into using these uh, in their workforce development strategies are reaping huge benefits and uh, they're finding uh, and, and developing skilled workers at a lower cost of, of recruiting. So the state of Alabama and the community college have also has several resources to support a company that's interested in supporting students uh, in apprenticeships. Um, there are tax incentives, by registering a program with the Alabama Office of Apprenticeships. And there are federal, federal grant funded programs such as the uh, Alabama Advanced Manufacturing Apprenticeship Program uh, that we call Alamap uh, for short, uh, that's currently available to support manufacturers uh, with apprenticeships. Uh, the community college also has several state and federal funded programs to support entry level production operator training such as Ready to Work uh, that's coupled with uh, mobile, mobilizing Alabama Pathways training uh, otherwise known as MAPS, um, that provides uh, manufacturing specific uh, knowledge and skills. And also uh, several of our colleges offer uh, MSSC, CPT and CLT, they're that certified production technician and certified logistics technician at no cost to students that are interested in enrolling in those programs. So there's, a, uh, there's also a program called the Alabama Workforce Stabil Stabilization Program that will support manufacturers and several uh, industry sectors uh, and several other industry sectors that will provide supplemental wages of $9 of a minimum $12 wage for up to 225 hours uh, of on the job training. We've got many re resources to support our manufacturers in the state uh, with work-based learning opportunities and their apprenticeships, uh, as well as to help them uh, upskill their current workforce. You know, we've worked with many, many companies through the years on our quality tools, quality improvement tools side of the, of our uh, offerings. And right now, especially in the last few years, raw material prices have gone, you know, out the roof. Uh, wages have gone up. The, the availability of uh, good folks out there, trained people, you know, they're getting scarce. And so, but that's not going to stop the demand for from customers and suppliers to cut their cost. And being really no way of controlling the price of raw materials, 
the, the, you know, the wage prices, they're going to turn to productivity. They're going to have to improve, reduce cost and productivity. And our lean twos, our quality twos, lean sigma, six sigma, they focus on those areas, streamlining process, reducing variation in the products, reducing scrap, reducing waste. All of those fall right along into the quality and lean tools. Yeah, Ronnie, I'm proud you bring that up. A lot of times when people hear a company has to cut costs, that doesn't mean trim labor. That doesn't mean lay people off. It's really getting down to what tools they can implement to improve productivity. Like you said, remove waste. Uh, how can they track their efficiencies from the standpoint of where their bottlenecks are in the plant, how to, to remove those bottlenecks? That's something that's critical uh, to keep manufacturing on the cutting edge here in Alabama is to demystify some of these programs, which is why a panel like this is so valuable and so important. Um, so it, I think making sure manufacturing organizations feel empowered to ask questions and say, you used that acronym, what does that mean? How can I utilize it? Um, so I would just encourage any manufacturers who view this to uh, reach out to these individuals and ask for clarification wherever we gloss over it because we live in this world every day. Robin, you make a fantastic point. And let me say this from the standpoint of the Alabama Community College System or the Alabama Technology Network, our workforce folks are more than happy to make a visit with you at your company and talk about what your specific needs are and put a customized plan together to address those. So great point. A lot of times we get called up in the alphabet soup of acronyms. So don't be ashamed to ask. Don't be, uh, don't hold back from calling it and asking us to come make a visit. That's what we do every day. Uh, with ATN staff all around the state of about 55 individuals. So we're happy to come walk through the plant with you and have that shop floor conversation. So that's a very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. I know we talked a little bit about uh, improving efficiencies, uh, reducing cost of production. Uh, we've talked a lot about industrial maintenance and technology. So someone help, uh, help answer that question from those unique uh, skill sets that we have that we deliver within our teams and within ATN or from maybe from the community college system. You know, ATN delivers a lot of the actual material and programs for a lot of these work-based learning programs. And I think that seems to be, uh, it, it certainly goes to Amanda's point about understanding what you're getting into when you go to work. You know, if you've never been in a certain manufacturing or pharmaceutical or food, you know, food product, it can be a bit of a shock. Uh, we've had clients recently talk about if you come into work on a jet fighter and you're making parts for a jet fighter, it can be a little intimidating first day on the job. Um, so anything that helps them learn as they go and, and help, you know, of course, obviously helps them from a salary standpoint seems to be the most effective. And more and more of those does grow every day uh, from just about any type of work-based learning skills, for, uh, pay for skills, whatever you'd like to call it. That certainly seems to be the most effective right now. Keith, I guess it's somewhat of an echo to what some panel has already said, but we have made tremendous strides in educating our public that manufacturing is not just removing parts that a machine has produced. It's learning the technology of that machine, understanding the process, having some of the business knowledge. Man manufacturing is not just a low wage, low excitement, low input job. There are tremendous opportunities out there and we have made that advancement, but there's still work for us to do to connect that next generation workforce to what today's companies needs. Our next question, as we've been engaged with manufacturers across the state, what have we noticed that has changed when it comes to their hiring practices as a result of the pandemic? Certainly it's been a challenge. There has been a reduction or a change of rehire policies. People are looking to, to, to do unique things. But that's one of the things, as challenging as that's been with the pandemic, the, the acclimation that the companies are starting to make to put more focus on their on, onboarding process, how they go through orientation, how they try to fit people to the job, show them the career pathway, don't just hire them to run the machine, but show them the whole influx of the company and what can be here. Yes, it's been a challenge, 
it's still a challenge and it will probably remain to be a challenge to get people to the door, but also it's getting the right person and putting some emphasis up front on keeping that person once you get them hired. And that's what's going to help make Alabama manufacturing continue to be strong, I think. And a lot of the feedback that you hear in the pharma and food sector is really the, the people coming in, whether it be straight out of high school from community college or from a four year or above top degree is really about the culture and the experience. So Barry's comments about um, you know, on the job training and apprenticeships where you actually learn the culture and see firsthand, at least in the food and pharma sector, um, can make a huge difference in, in somebody coming in with retention because you just don't know what to expect. Um, you know, when you walk in the door and you're working in a clean room um, environment, for example. And then you also have to think about um, there, there's a lot of things that we can take from the recent pandemic where the younger millennials and the Generation Z group will be looking more for um, diverse work experiences. So maybe telework for part of the week or, or part of the month and just a varied workspace other than being tied to a, a cubicle every day. Some of the things we've seen too is, is they're really truly honing in on what skills a person has. They're actually going to the point of saying if we verify that you have these skills industrial maintenance or whatever the case may be, they'll even waive those requirements. Um, particularly in COVID, a lot of times they'll, they'll do a pre-assessment of an employee, uh, whether it be technical, whether it be some other type, just to verify skills and they'll even waive sometimes some of the higher education requirements just to have the people with the skill set. So back to Barry's point of delivering those specific skills seems to be a much higher problem. And, and you're absolutely right, Brad, uh, tying back in with what Barry said. I think this is a, an interesting point that, you know, with the pandemic it, it, highlighting this, companies have to be very creative today since their workforce is limited. They want to hire, but for whatever reasons, uh, uh, the, the people are not coming and not coming on board. So the companies still have to function and have to move forward. So they're trying to tap into all of the skill sets and resources that they have on hand. And um, so it, it's different. It's, it's very different. It's very different today. Something that I think a lot of you are touching on that we've observed um, in our interactions with human resources leadership in manufacturing facilities is that there's had to be um, kind of a retooling of sorts of the thought process of someone who works in a human resources department who's screening applicants. They have had to relearn how to read a resume because a talented individual that they might have overlooked before they don't have the luxury of overlooking that individual today. They've really got to capitalize on what resources are coming to them. Um, so we're seeing a lot of human resources professionals reaching out and saying, how do I, um, how do I shift from being accustomed to looking at resumes that focus on degrees to resumes that focus on skill sets um, and competencies. And that's something that we talk a lot about um, providing help to at the state level, um, those individuals working in those leadership roles um, on how to read those things and how to capitalize on opportunities to employ individuals that normally wouldn't have jumped off the page for them. Robin, you make a great point. I think um, because of that, uh, that reason, we're seeing more companies that are waiving the requirement for a high school diploma and or GED. Um, there are companies that are more open to hiring those with prior criminal backgrounds, uh, depending on uh, the offense, of course. And uh, uh, those uh, that are hiring our previously incarcerated are, are finding that they're a great source of talent and uh, basically an untapped resource. So, um, uh, also, uh, many companies are offering programs internally to, to develop their internal employees uh, for higher skilled positions uh, and then replacing the lower skilled positions um, is another trend that I, that I see occurring. So, Yeah, Barry, I'm going to piggyback on your comments. You know, one of the things that you and I both are familiar with is some of the comment or visits we've had with veterans and the veterans hospitals from the standpoint of looking at that population and being able to transfer transfer their military occupational specialties 
and to civilian resumes. Uh, so, so I think Robin brings up a great point that uh, the workforce from, it, from the standpoint of business and industry, in particular manufacturers are really taking a hard look and not making passes on individuals in the past that they might have just kind of simply passed over because it wasn't on paper. So I think this is a great conversation. How has COVID impacted training? Using a hybrid of virtual and face-to-face -face, uh, is probably more commonplace and, and in going forward. Uh, so internally, yes, definitely uh, using all of those tools that are available to us. Each generation has, has learned differently, uh, is, uh, has been exposed to different types of technology. So as we teach those uh, various generations, we need to be able to speak their language and use the technology that they can tune into. So as an instructor, we need to be familiar with all of those different types of um, technological devices and the ways to uh, provide the instruction so that the that particular generation can absorb the information and make the connections with the various concepts and applications of what we're teaching. So we have to be very creative sometimes uh, to make those connections with some of those technical concepts. Yeah, and just to kind of piggyback the, what I have seen, not only in the methodology of delivery of internal training, but also the, the company's approach to it, what you're seeing is very much a grow your own mentality. Uh, it was a very tough labor market prior to COVID, but then you add the effects of COVID to it. They're very much internally focused on their internal people, whether it be the work-based learning apprenticeships, all the things we've already talked about it. They tend to look internal first. So they may be training that ATN's done, but then they couple it with either internal training that's company driven or you know something along uh, the work-based learning line. But it's certainly become a much more internal focus. You used to train an operator, then you train technicians, then you had a safety team. But now then, that operator has to know how to perform some pretty technical maintenance. They also have to be aware of the safety. So, so the amount of training that goes in has increased, which is a great thing. But that means we have to keep up with the demand. We're not just training an operator. We're training an operator technician that's also going to be involved in safety. They may need a little bit of the business end combined to make the right decision. So it's not just a specific point. It's a very broad broad range of training you have to deliver today for the employee that the companies are looking for. It, it encouraged us to embrace technology as a way to expand our offerings. Um, so we've really seen that as a blessing um, for our association. And it's something that we see is going to stay with us forever. Um, you know, that we'll basically always have a hybrid option to engage with uh, what we do as an association so that those members of the leadership teams and facilities can get access to training and resources while still being able to be physically present and on site at their facilities. Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of the, go along with what everyone else has said. We're seeing that you know, early on when people were quarantined for COVID and it's still ongoing, you know, it's an opportunity to do things like an OSHA class. We, we actually have one going on today as we speak. You know, it gives an opportunity to maybe, if an employee is at home, can't come to work, it gives an opportunity to at least get a little internal training done. In some cases, it's regulatory, things like that. And that, you know, that's ongoing and will continue. What credentials are necessary for many of the manufacturing opportunities across the state, i.e. certifications, degrees, credentials? What, what's needed across the state from your perspective? most important thing I think that uh, companies are looking for are persons who are willing to learn, uh, who are willing to, to show up and to be there. Uh, and as long as they have the willingness to learn, the companies are willing to train and provide them with the skills that, that are needed. I recently talked to a, a plant owner. He, he has a, a small manufacturing plant where they do a lot of welding. Um, and he could not keep welders. He would find them. They came in, they came in, they'd work a few weeks, they'd get more pay or at a bigger company and leave. So, but he had a forklift operator, young man he had hired, didn't have the opportunity to go to college, you know, after high school, but he showed up every day. He was on time. 
He had a positive attitude, uh, just an all around great employee. So he talked to him one day about, hey, would you like to start trying to train the whale? Of course, the young young man did, and he learned. He picked it up real quick. Um, he were he was actually contributing to production by doing some non certified welding joints, not anything you know that is along the lines of being coated or anything, of course. But the the man at the company had he had um, agreed to put him through two years of college at the, at the local uh, junior college, community college, uh, to get a welding degree. So in which he's uh, interested in robotics, the, the plant owner. So who knows where this young man may, may lead to just because this, this owner take, uh, took a chance on it and uh, it's working out great so far. It's gonna be good to see how it turns out completely. But uh, the certifications, Yes, there'll always be a need for those, but going back to, I guess, some of the earlier things said, they're gonna to have to be creative on how they find those folks to get there, to, to assist on that. You make very good points, as all of you have today. But you know, we, we talk about our delivery is anywhere from four hours to five days. It's rapid, it's get in, get out, and train to what the company's asking for, and to me, that just lines up so well with a micro credential and for the benefit of the individual to be able to stack those and continue to add to those. I think it's definitely uh, kind of the way of the future. Uh, we'll never do away with just complete, uh, you know, customized training based on the needs of a company. But I think there's cases where a lot of the things that we do successfully every day will lead to some micro credentials. And I think that's going to be good for the individuals who go through our training. So let's move to the last question. As we prepare to end this panel discussion today, are the things that manufacturers need from communities, from the individuals who apply for jobs with those manufacturers or from other stakeholders that are commonly overlooked? I know we've had some great conversations today about how HR uh, has taken a different look at resumes from individuals coming through and not passing uh, because it's not necessarily on paper. So are there things that are being overlooked that uh, they need from us? From a community standpoint, uh, I, I think from uh, ma manufacturers need their communities to understand who they are, what they do, and what great opportunities and jobs that they offer. There's many, so many people uh, that live in the community uh, where there's a manufacturer that they don't even know the manufacturer even exists there. I think that's uh, correct. You know, a lot of uh, manufacturers in different communities, both large and small, what they're going to look for is the community support in terms of helping them find employees, letting letting the the local community know what the company does, to lo know that it's a very good job. A lot of times these companies are are, are known, but Many times, uh, you know, you hear, oh, I don't know what they do. I hear they hire them. But helping the, you know, helping that company grow, foster their community is a win-win for everybody because then the community grows and, you know, things like that. So maintaining, you know, good relationships with the community, but also helping them, you know, particularly with any kind of technology or anything that helps them continue to grow is, is a lot of times it's once you get the company there, it kind of stops. I think the support is is usually greater once the company is there to help them grow and maintain that local presence. You know, I think this manufacturing day and manufacturing month is a great opportunity for those local manufacturers to open up their doors and showcase what they do to their community. And I would say this, if there's a manufacturer out there who's interested in, in having such an event, please reach out to us at the Alabama Technology Network. We'll be glad to help work with you and coordinate a manufacturing day event, uh, if it's virtual or if it's face-to-face, -face, we'd love to get the community in and let them see what takes place behind the gate, behind the doors, so that your word gets out there and your success in what you do in the community is recognized. Thank you for joining us today in this panel discussion related to manufacturing in Alabama and for helping us celebrate Manufacturing Day and Manufacturing Month. 